We are at Romans chapter 5, and I do have some slides, but I will show them later. <laughs> they are not of the verses, they are of the uh, New England Primer, a book that you may have heard about from me or from school, depending. But Romans 5 is the place. And, uh, oh. It is the place. And uh, we had covered verses 1 and 2 in a previous lesson, so I'm going to start later than that one. Now, uh, what we are doing here is we are continuing in the series on faith and works, and Romans is one of the letters that is most often misunderstood and misinterpreted um, in this context. It is usually a very... Um, simple error that leads everything else off course which is the idea in the minds of some that the letter is trying to draw a distinction between salvation by works of obedience and or commandment keeping or salvation by faith alone apart from works and that is false uh, the Bible does not have anything in it that teaches anything that is even a second cousin to faith alone apart from works of obedience. The Bible would never lead you to any idea that we don't need to obey God or that we, we can't obey God. Um, the very first generation from Adam, Cain, was told, sin's desire is for you, but you must master it. If you do well, will you not be lifted up? It's very clear that even the very first generation from Adam, if anybody were going to be stained, you'd think it'd be, it'd be them. No, they were told that they were responsible for their own actions and that it was up to them what they, whether they would do right or wrong. And it's always been that way. No, what is Romans about? Well, it's about Jew and Gentile. It's about the law of Moses and the law of Christ and which one is the one that we need to keep today and, and what is the one where salvation is for the whole world in the way that Abraham was promised. That's what Romans is talking about. And it has a lot of things to say about um, the distinction between those and the way in which the law of Christ fulfills and, and um, I guess is better than the law that came before it, the law of Moses. But it also has a lot in there about what it is that we get from the law that's beneficial and what the benefit of being uh, a Jew uh, in the ancient world was about and the usefulness of this and how the Jew and the Gentile bring different things to the table and they're both good and they benefit from each other and they need each other. That's what this letter is really about <laughs> in the meta, I guess we would say. But here in uh, chapter 5, we're talking about Adam quite a bit. And we're talking about the big picture. So, at verse 3, when we talk about having been justified by faith in Jesus, the way that Abraham was justified by faith without having been circumcised first, We find in the third verse that we have reason to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but also that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Uh, James chapter 1 says count it all joy meaning reckon it or um, you know figure it all joy brethren when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance so it's a change when you are in the law of Moses when you read the Old Testament 
the promises are physical. Not that there aren't spiritual ones, but they're looking at physical prosperity, physical blessings, um, you know, national peace, rest from their national enemies on all sides. But the promises in Jesus are spiritual in nature. And it means that, well, sometimes those physical things don't go the way you want them to. And there are trials, there are difficulties, there are things that happen that are bad, but there's a sense in which that's okay because we know that this is just temporary, that our citizenship is in heaven, that our salvation is by faith, and that we seek a city whose builder and founder is God, whose foundations are not of this world. So in that sense, we rejoice, yes, in the hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice too in our sufferings. Not that we enjoy suffering, but to say we realize that it will have a good spiritual result and that this will result in the glory of God and our glorification too when he appears again. And then he says in the sixth verse, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He means, truly, before we were repentant, he made it possible for us to have forgiveness, to be reconciled to him, offering Jesus as the sacrifice. So that's been done. It's up to you whether you will repent and become a child of God, but the sacrifice has been made. The way has been inaugurated. God has made it so even when we were still in our sins. Christ died for us. Since therefore, ninth verse of Romans 5, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We were justified by his blood, meaning God considered us righteous the way that he considered Abraham righteous when we believed him, which was evidenced in his case by the offering of Isaac, in our case by our repentance, our baptism in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. We were justified in that blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. He doesn't mean that while you live in your sins, that the sacrifice of Jesus made you forgiven while you were still sinning. No, he means that's how you got out of your sins. There was an offering made that you merely had to accept. It was the gift of God. But now that you have been justified, meaning you have become a Christian, you are a believer in God, you have something else going on. Much more, verse 10, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So you as a Christian are the ones who have been reconciled, who have been justified, because you had the same faith that Abraham did, as evidenced by your being buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Now that having been done, there is a life to live. And the life of Jesus is what saves us from the wrath of God. More than that, we also rejoice, verse 11, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Meaning we've been re reconciled to God. We, we, you know, to reconcile, make, you know, come together Put your differences in the past you know, re rejoin uh, that relationship and uh, start over if you will and what he's really getting at what he's really getting at in the 11th verse of Romans 5 more than that we also rejoice in God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What he's really saying is, through Jesus, through whom we now have reconciliation, not through Moses, who then could not bring reconciliation. You could not be reconciled. That's what Hebrews is talking about when he said that the offerings could not purify the conscience of the worshipers. Otherwise, the offerings would have stopped, to be, uh, stopped being offered. But no, there's only a reminder of sins. They cannot, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. So now we have reconciliation, and it's in Jesus, not in Moses. That's what he's really saying, which I know because of Romans 11, uh, verses 13, 14, and 15. In Romans 11, we have the same word about reconciliation. And it's clear what he's saying. In 13, 14, 15 of Romans 11, he said, I'm speaking to you Gentiles now, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, says Paul. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their, recon or if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? It's clear, he's talking about Jew and Gentile. Under Moses, we couldn't have reconciliation. In Jesus, we have reconciliation. And, he, and in Romans 11, he's referring back to the idea that, uh, which is true, that Israel at first rejected the Lord and behold, we turn to the Gentiles, Paul said famously in the Acts. And the word spread throughout the world, not just in Judea, not just among Israel. And that means to say, you know, that's what he means when he says, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, <laughs> well, what would their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So if it was good for the world in some sense, and that's what Romans is, that's the needle of, or that's the, yeah, that's the needle that he's threading. <laughs> it's good in some sense that Israel rejected it because the word spread all over the world. The world was saved by their rejection, if you will, or was brought to reconciliation. Well, but how much more if they accept it? Won't that just be life from, life from the dead? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, yeah, we would be greatly blessed in that. And that's the idea. Jew, uh, Jew. Uh, Paul is one such person who is an example of what Jesus said that, you know, the, um, the scribe who obeys the gospel is like a man who brings out of his treasure something old and something new. That's what Paul can do. That's what Peter can do. All the apostles can do because they know the law. They know the Old Testament. They can teach us. A great many things. So reconciliation comes through Jesus, not through Moses. That's what he's really getting at. And if we go back again in Romans 5, um, I guess I would ask, there is also a little something hanging on here, at verse 10, which is, we're reconciled, we're saved by his life. We're already reconciled to God. If you will, we're saved. But how much more will we be delivered from the wrath of God by his life? How is that? It's kind of, it's a dangling carrot. Just put that out there. Why is he saying that? What does he mean? Because he'll talk about it in the next chapter. Come back to Romans 5. All right. Therefore... 12th verse, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's Romans 5, 12. And the thought does get interrupted. And so I would point out that where the thought gets picked up again is the 18th verse. At 12, it gets broken. Sin comes into the world through one man 
death through sin, and death spreads to all men because all men sinned. And the 18th verse is where this gets picked up again. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, that is Jesus giving himself, leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. That's the proper uh, joining of, of verses together. This is what we mean by that when we say it in the 12th verse. Sin came into the world through one man. Death came into the world through sin. Death spread to all men because all men sinned. That's very, very plain, I think. And again in the 18th, that one trespass led to condemnation for all men because sin rightly is condemned and all men have sinned. One act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men because Jesus' act of righteousness means we can be saved, we can be forgiven. Everybody who instead of sinning like Adam sinned lives right like Jesus lived can be saved. That's all we're getting at. One man's obedience made many people sinners in a way. In what way? In the way that was specified in verse 12. Death spread to all men because all men sinned. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. How, how, is, how are they made righteous by the obedience of Jesus? Well, they died when they disobeyed the way that Adam disobeyed. We died when we disobeyed the way Adam disobeyed. We also shall live when we obey the way Jesus obeyed. That's what we mean. So back to 12. Um, this is the right, you know, combination of verses here to understand all he's saying uh, about this. He's contrasting what happened from Adam and what happened from Jesus. And there's, there's more compare and contrast in this letter and other letters. But Adam is a type of the Christ. He's the first of his kind. And unfortunately, he made the wrong choice. And all of us who have come along after that have also made the wrong choice. And the result of that is death. We, we're all of us condemned before God because of our sins. But Jesus made the right choices. And we can choose to live like him and God in his grace forgives us and we can have eternal life in him. So moving to the 13th now, the 13th verse is an, inter is an interruption. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Sin was in the world before the law was given, meaning the law of Moses. There was wrongdoing without the law of Moses. What Paul's doing here is stepping outside of the discussion. <laughs> we know the discussion is Jew and Gentile, but he's stepping outside for a little bit and saying, you know, there was a whole world that existed before the law of Moses and sin was there too. How can that exist if the law of Moses is the thing that defines sin? That's what he's getting at. It can't be that they were just lawless. Sin is not counted where there is no law. What he means is it, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. It's not being counted in the sense of uh, the law of Moses has no bearing on what happened in those times. 
and is not relevant to what we're talking about. Yet, the 14th verse, nevertheless, let's close that loop. <laughs> Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. No, the law of Moses had nothing to do, you know, it didn't have anything to do with what came before. The sins that had been uh, accomplished in the past were not sins because they failed to conform to the law of Moses. They were sins because they're sins. And God is the one who defines sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. That's why it says, nevertheless, or yet. So we'll close that loop. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Just saying, everybody did something. Maybe it wasn't what Adam had done exactly, but it's all of its sin, and that is why death reigned. However, 15th verse, the free gift is not like the trespass, if many died through one man's trespass, much more of the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. The judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Hmm. Here we are contrasting Adam and Christ. Adam is a type of Christ. But it's just a type. The substance in the Lord is that he is the free gift, not the trespass. The trespass has many dying through one man. Now, the free gift of Jesus means that many have the grace of God. And in the same way, there's a difference between the free gift and that one man's sin. The judgment that followed the one sin brought condemnation, but the free gift followed many sins and brought justification. It's just interesting. You say many sins led to condemnation on the one. On the other hand, or I'm sorry, one sin led to uh, many deaths or many condemnations. Now one uh, free gift uh, in response to many trespasses brings one justification. It's all brought back together. And then, um, you know, the 17th, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, right? See above verse 14, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. They have the gift of righteousness. They reign in life, which is what we read earlier in the 10th verse. Remember, while enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son. Now, having been reconciled, we are saved by the life of his son. That's what he's getting at in this verse. And that's why he concludes again, 18 and 19, one trespass led to condemnation for all, one act of righteousness leads to justification for all. One man's disobedience made many sinners, one man's obedience made many righteous. And there should be a certain equivalence here. Why should Satan be more powerful than God? Why should darkness be more powerful than light? If Satan speaks a lie, and people believe that lie and are destroyed, why does God have to do anything more than speak the truth? And people believe that truth and are saved. There should be a certain equivalence about it that kind of makes sense. And now, um, as promised, I'll share, I think, <laughs> I will share, not a phone call, but I will share 
what I believe, oops, is the New England Primer. Now let's see. It's working. The reason that I am sharing this with you now, which is a departure from the scriptures, but I want you to see it, is that this is our country. This is our culture. <laughs> if you will, this is where we came from. <laughs> the Puritans, remember the pilgrims that got on the boats and came over here? Uh, you know, who are the reason that we're all speaking this language called English, you know? <laughs> Although we'll never adopt the metric system, I'm pretty sure. Um, they brought with them a book, a primer, as it's called. The primer is basically the elementary school teacher's edition, is what a primer is. <laughs> it is the, the starting point for education. And in those days, of course, people had a schoolmaster who taught all the grades, you know, in a single schoolhouse, in a single room, that kind of thing. But the primer is for the primary grades, the early, the thing that is being taught to the children. This is the 1777 edition, which, uh, you know, I'm not very good at math, but I believe this is one year after our nation's founding. Um, it was in circulation prior to this. It had come over with the pilgrims, as we said, or rather that they had come up with this, I should say. Um, the reason for sharing it with you is that this was the textbook of America for a very long time. This is what all the little American boys and girls were taught for a very long time. It was our curriculum. The letter A. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. <laughs> the very beginning of the alphabet as taught to America was this, the letter A. How do we remember the letter A? Well, how about a rhyme? That would be a good mnemonic, yes. Now, what should we use? Hmm. Right, so the letter A becomes Adam. Adam's fall, we sinned all. That is Calvinism. <laughs> but the thing about it is, it's not just a talking point um, among uh, preachers. It, it's not just uh, something to be put on a slide and shot down. This was America's textbook. This is the fabric of our nation that people believe this. That's why uh, today... Um, even today, in political discourse, nobody makes choices. It's who they are. <laughs> it's how they were born. Calvinism, that's all it is. It's just Calvinism. It's wrong. But that's why they do that, because that's what everybody has done since the 1600s on this continent. But yes, this is a nice little woodcut illustration here. I believe it's a woodcut. Uh, you know, this looks like an unclothed woman, a snake wrapped around some tree of unknown type. One of the, the great parts of the Prima is this section written by John Cotton. You may have heard of John Cotton, especially if you studied English in college on the section or the, the readings about the Puritan authors, they will talk of John Cotton, who wrote spiritual milk for American babes, as in babes in Christ, as in King James for new Christians, children. 
I just learned from Emily that Babe Ruth was so called because when he went uh, to sign up for the league, he was only 17 and he was not allowed to sign himself up. He had to be signed up by his guardian. That's why they called him Babe Ruth, because he was just a baby. <laughs> I didn't realize that. That's kind of a fun thing. But yes, spiritual milk for American babes, drawn out of the breasts of both testaments for their soul's nourishment. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> just going to leave that there with no commentary. But, you know, there's a bunch of questions and answers in this purported, uh, uh, again, spiritual milk for the children. This is for the little guys. When they're in elementary school, this is what they learn. How did God make you? In my first parents, holy and righteous. As in, you're not an um, illegitimate child, you were not born of fornication, you know, this kind of thing. All of the things that people look down upon. Another time, another place. Are you then born holy and righteous? No, is the answer here. My first father sinned, and I in him. That's the letter A. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. So the first question is, how did he make you and my first parents holy and righteous? As in, your parents are doing what our community requires them to do, or you would not be here talking to us. You would be, you know, an outcast. However, does that mean that you are born holy and righteous? No. They are taught at an early age, no, my first father sinned and I in him. Are you then born a sinner? I was conceived in sin and born in iniquity. How's that for elementary school? Can we, can we try that in kindergarten next year, Emily? You think so? No? <laughs> Probably not. Um, this is a perversion of the Psalms. Remember, David said, I was conceived in iniquity. But that has nothing to do with this at all. It's not what he's talking about. What is your birth sin, child? How could you have sin? Adam's sin imputed to me and a corrupt nature dwelling within me. Yes, imputed, no doubt, is on every second grader's spelling list these days, I think. Corrupt nature, no doubt what our fifth graders are grappling with in elementary schools across the land. This is what they taught the children. What is your birth sin? Adam's sin imputed to me and a corrupt nature dwelling within me. What is your corrupt nature? Oh, my corrupt nature is empty of grace, bent unto sin, only unto sin, and that continually. Perversion of Genesis 6 where the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. And yet Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now the Puritans would say that's because God arbitrarily chose Noah to be saved, even though he was just as filthy and wretched as everybody else who was killed. The Bible doesn't say that. Puritans say that. The Bible doesn't say that at all. But yes, this is what they taught people. And this is basically still what people believe. As I said, in the modern political discourse, you see it all the time. It's all about your nature, how you were born. And nobody can make choices anymore. They have to be something. They have to have an identity. It's just not true, friends. It's Calvinism. But more than that, Modern religions, Baptist religion, Presbyterian, you know, so many of them do exactly this. That, oh yes, of course you're, you, ha you have a sinful nature. In fact, they even have the New International Version, which translates the word flesh with the words sinful nature multiple times. It is not warranted, no. 
There is nothing in the text that would warrant such a conclusion. And if you happen to have one of the annotated ones that has footnotes, and you look at the footnote for sinful nature, where it should say flesh, they'll point you back to the psalm. I was conceived in iniquity. It's just the New England primer, man. That's all they're doing. That's all they've been doing the whole time. <laughs> it's evil. And then the high school material, the shorter catechism. The shorter one, thankfully, I think it'd be dreadful to go with the longer. On reading this, as agreed upon by the Reverend Assembly of Divines of Westminster. Oh, well, therefore. Did all mankind fall in Adam's first transgression? High schoolers. Is this on the AP exam? I'm not sure. The covenant being made with Adam. Here's the right answer. Not only for himself, but for his posterity, all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation, <laughs> sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. What do you mean by ordinary generation? Oh, well, there was one extraordinary generation. Oh, really? And what was that? Oh, well, you know, Jesus was born of Mary, yet without sin. Oh, I see. So he didn't have flesh as you and I have flesh? Well, I didn't say that. Well, but I think you did. You just did, right? <laughs> uh, wrong. Question 17. Into what estate did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. Okay, sort of. Not really. It's true that sin entered the world and death entered the world. And suffering entered the world because of sin. That is true. Uh, estate, not exactly. All of mankind, not exactly. We are born pure until we sin. 18. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate, wherein two men fell? Well, the sinfulness of that estate, wherein two men fell, comma. You see the typical American question and answer response. You have to restate the question for me, please. Consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want or lack of original righteousness and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed therefrom. Right. So it is the guilt of Adam's first sin that we have, the lack of original righteousness, meaning we make no righteous choices, and the corruption of our entire nature. All of this rolled up into what is commonly called original sin that we inherited together with anything else that you do. <laughs> you bad person. You were already born bad and then you made bad choices on top of that. Now you see how the Puritans are. And now, you, now you know where sinners in the hands of an angry God comes from and all that stuff. This is their thinking. Yes. Comparing this again to what you actually read in Romans. Go back, Romans 5, 12. Sin came into the world through one man. That's Adam. Death came through sin. So death spread to all men because all men were born and descended from Adam. No, that's not what it says. Right? <laughs> because they inherited it from... No? That's not what it says. Why did death spread to all men? Because all sinned. That's what the Bible says. The 50, 14th verse said, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So first of all, the primer is wrong in this very simple premise. Nobody inherited sin or corruption from Adam. Death enters the world through Adam because he's the first to sin. Okay. But we all have made the same choices and that results in the suffering and misery that we do see. That's true. But it's because we have made those choices. Now, if you go back... Um, uh, in the uh, 19th verse, 
By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now here's the other thing. If Adam's <clears throat> sin is necessarily inherited by everybody descended from Adam, the entire world are all sinners, then why aren't the entire world all Christians? Because it says, the one... Uh, 18th verse, the one trespass led to condemnation for all. One act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. One disobedience made many sinners. One obedience made many righteous. If Adam requires all of us to be born utterly sinful, then why doesn't Jesus require all of us to, to be born Christians? It says they are the same mechanism. And they are the same mechanism. That mechanism is free will. You choose whether you will serve sin leading to death or whether you will serve righteousness leading to life. That's the answer. And it's exactly where he's going in the very next chapter, which we'll talk about at the next opportunity, the Lord willing. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, I tell you these things, again, not to have a, a straw man to knock down or an easy target. I, I tell you because that is our country. <laughs> Understand that every institution, every you know, man-made religion was founded on these things. That's why you see it everywhere in our country. Um, it isn't, the, you know, it's not that terribly unique. You can see the same leanings in the Friends of Job, for example. Uh, calling it Calvinism is a little bit hubristic, a little postmodernistic. He was not the first to think that way. Job's friends thought that way. It's been around for a very long time, I understand. But it's literally true that in our case, our flavor of that <laughs> has been the New England Primer. And it clearly has colored the discourse of our nation um, the whole time. So I tell you about those things, and I think there's a lot of confusion about this inside and outside the church too. Probably because of the interference coming in from the culture all around us. To be you know frank about it it's a tough problem and so i think it's good to be aware of what that is and where it came from and what the effect of that would might be for us and that's why i bring that to your attention it's also kind of funny <laughs> in a dark way sorry <laughs> it's kind of funny when you look at it like really you thought this was appropriate for children like what kind of crazy people are these well they're kind of crazy people that would get on a boat and you know, leave their continent is what, it, what it's about. Uh, I'm glad that they did. I'm, I'm grateful for our country. I'm just saying to your friends, this part is not good. This thing, this is wrong. And it's laced in there with the good things. So watch out. The Lord willing, we'll pick up Romans 6 at the next opportunity. And I really believe that uh, verses 20 and 21 are actually Romans 6, negative 2 and negative 1. <laughs> Uh, they actually are part of Romans 6. They don't go with this chapter. The same way that the last two verses of 4 go with 5. Um, there might be reasons for that. Men made up the chapter and verse divisions, you know. But no, uh, clearly 20 and 21 go with 6. And we'll talk about that at the next opportunity. Today, are you a child of God? Put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, that you might be forgiven, that you might be um, resurrected in Christ Jesus, a new creature created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not having been reconciled to God, we are to live the way that he lived and to be saved from the wrath of God through trials, but through to the end. If today you are a Christian and have not lived right, let us pray that you might be restored to him. If you need today the prayers of the saints or if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need be known in the spirit by coming to the front. 
while together we stand and sing the song selected. 